Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Okay, thank you. Well, these are my two, uh, I've won two renditions of Minsky, and you'll be seeing a third occasionally. And what I want to do today is explain partly where the model came from, because my 1995 JPKE paper was attempting to model the financial instability hypothesis. But I actually started writing it in August of 1992, which is well before neoclassicals invented what they thought was the great moderation. So I went back and found the original program I wrote it in, that's, that's the, the date of creation, 2nd of August of 92, uh, which is slightly before uh, they invented this idea of the great moderation. And what I did in building the model was take Goodwin's growth cycle model and follow the suggestion I found in John Blatt's excellent book, Dynamic Economic Systems. Out of print, I have a PDF. Anybody wants a copy, send me an email. And in explaining the Goodwin model brilliantly, Blatt finished off by saying that, first of all, one of the flaws was that it had an equilibrium that was not unstable which is a complete inversion of the way the neoclassicals think everything has to be stable. And secondly, he suggested one way you could bring in instability was by including money or credit. And having read Minsky, I thought, well, that's the perfect way to go. So I'd use Minsky, Goodwin as the foundation for building a model of Minsky. And what I did to do that was to add realism, which is what you can do with genuine dynamic approaches. So rather than having the unrealistic assumption that capitalists invest precisely their profits, whether they're positive or negative, I said, in reality, they invest more than during a boom and less during a slump and they finance the difference with debt. So that was a simple idea to bring it in. It literally took me less than an hour to build that, that first go of the model. When I generated the, the first graphs out of it, it gave, yes, it gave it the debt crisis that I wanted to manifest, but it had a completely unexpected dynamic. I had no idea that I was going to see this dynamic between employment rate, wage share of output, which are graphed on the, on the uh, bottom of the axis, and the vertical axis, which is the banker's share of output, which is entirely driven in the model by the ratio of private debt to GDP. And I gave me a nice little, what I thought was rhetorical flourish at the end of the paper of saying that the chaotic dynamics explored in this paper, and this is my first personal experience of chaos, uh, should warn us against accepting a period of relative tranquility in the capitalist economy as anything other than a lull before the storm. Well, then, effectively, it happened. We had both the Great Moderation and the Great Recession. And looking back at the data, it's not the first time. We have two phenomena now, the 1920s to 1940s and the and 1990s to 2010, and they both had the same phenomena, not as clearly shown in the data, data back from the 1920s, of course, but declining cycles in inflation, ending up in deflation before the crisis, minor level of deflation, and declining cycles in employment as well and then the explosion for the crash. And of course, their modern data much clearer. There's what the neoclassicals thought was the great moderation. They've got the whole system sorted. Everything's wonderful. Uh, and then, bang, it all falls apart. Exactly the same basic dynamics. Declining cycles in inflation and unemployment, and then suddenly a collapse. And what the neoclassicals ignore, which is the part that I brought in with the model, was rising private debt levels and deleveraging what the private sector once the credit prices began. So that's the data from the 1920s normalised to fit, to be consistent with data from post-45, but a rising level of private debt, which we focus upon, not remembering, in fact, that there was massive deleveraging going on at the same time. The ratio rose because debt was falling less rapidly than GDP itself was falling. And, of course, the most recent data, same phenomenon. Rising level of private debt going up in a series of cycles, and then finally the crisis beginning when the rate of change of private debt slowed down. So we had this... We have these two empirical records now. Uh, we don't have any many data points as physicists do, but it's about time we realise we have at least two on giant financial crises. And the same dynamics occurred in my model. So um, in that sense, I realise my model directly supports one of Minsky's strongest statements to say that capitalism is inherently flawed, prone to booms, crises and depressions, which the instability being due to characteristics the financial system must possess if it is to be consistent with full-blown capitalism. And then said that will generate both desire to invest and the capacity to finance that accelerating investment. Now, I've shown, I'll show that the model itself can be derived not by starting from a set of you know, questionable assumptions, so to speak, which is the way a lot of people look at the Goodwin model initially, but out of strict identities that are strictly true. And then when you put them in the simplest possible model, you get the results I show here. So this is a model with no government, with no Ponzi lending and no bankruptcy. So in that sense, as Janus Varoufakis once described it, it's an Austrian economist's wet dream. But uh, one of my favourite movies uh, had a little slogan saying, like, all the dreams you've ever had. 
and not just the good ones. So it doesn't quite work out the way that the Austrians expect. So even with a simply linear set of a behavioural functions, I get the dynamics of both a great moderation and a crisis once you acknowledge the role of private debt. And, of course, that's what uh, Minsky brought to the equation. And to emphasise, Minsky, like many people, saw a relationship between private debt and income. He never quite articulated it properly or fully. He didn't convince these other post-Keynesians, even his own followers in many cases, but he convinced me and I, I ran with that. So there's a role for debt in economics. Now, the neoclassicals that deny that role, and this is the classic statement by Bernanke where he rejects Fisher's debt deflation theory completely on a priori grounds without even checking to see whether there's any data to support it <laughs> on the basis that the traded debt is simply a transfer from one group of agents to another with no effect on income because the spending power of one goes down, the other goes up and they cancel each other out. Neoclassical nonsense but that's why they haven't learnt the, the cause of this crisis now. So the model that I built back in the 90s can be built by starting from a set of strictly true identities and then modelling them with the simplest possible structure. So the identities are the employment rate will rise if economic growth exceeds the sum of growth in labour productivity and population growth. Wages share of output will rise if wage demands exceed growth in labour productivity. And the private debt ratio will rise if private debt grows faster than the rate of economic growth. And they're simply facts. Uh, and put them together in equations, and thank you for Matthias for correcting me from dots to hats yesterday. So the, the, the percentage rate of growth of, of uh, employment is shown there, and that's the rate of change of the re, uh, rate of real growth minus labour productivity and population growth. That's wages share of output, which is driven by wage demands in real terms here. Uh, and then the debt ratio, which is driven by private debt growth. And just to spell those equations out, that's just simply the rate of, uh, the rate of economic growth. That's the rate of, popula of uh, technical change, rate of population growth, wage share wage demands. There's no argument about a Phillips curve here yet. There's simply a, a factual identity. Debt ratio and the rate of growth of private debt. So that's all. At this stage, they're simply definitions. They can't be disagreed with. Uh, what I then do is put that into the simplest possible model. And I get all these phenomena we've seen in the last 20 years, and as I argue towards the end, perhaps the entire post-war period, once you bring in uh, France dynamics as well. You get a great moderation and a great recession. You get rising private debt and rising inequality. They're all causally linked, and Gail will be doing a lot more about that after I do, and so, so Matthias. So the simplest possible model has output as a linear function of capital. Investment a linear function of the profit rate. Employment a linear function of output. And wage change a linear function of the employment rate. And change of debt simply being investment minus profit. So there's no uh, speculative, no, no Ponzi lending going on here in that sense. So you have a straight accelerator relation for, for output, investment uh, net of depreciation, very important to include depreciation, Goodwin did not do that. Uh, and a linear investment function, profit being net of wages and interest payments, and employment being just output divided by labour productivity. The wage rate, uh, and I bring in a linear Phillips curve here, just for simplicity at this stage, and then the change in debt being investment minus profits. Now, when you put that all together and you expand it, that's the model you get. The, the items in red are the variables. There's only three. And the items in black are the parameters to the system. There are nine. Now, it's fundamentally nonlinear due to structural interactions. There's no behavioural nonlinear whatsoever in this particular model. And what you have is lambda in the first equation multiplied by both omega and d. In the second equation, you have omega times lambda. And in the third equation, you have debt multiplied by both omega and itself. So you've got a you've got a, a, a genuine quadratic in that particular term, which is what gives you two potential equilibrium states in the system. And you can't reform those away. We often talk about how do we avoid the crisis, what do we do to stop subprime lending, yada, yada, yada. You can't do anything to get rid of these. So in that sense, Minsky's argument about capitalism being inherently flawed is true. We simply have to cope with those flaws, which so far we haven't realised how to do. Um, so I bring in nonlinearity later for realism, but to, to give you an idea of what actually happens uh, you, what, and why this happens, we've gone from a two-dimensional model where in, in a dynamic two-dimensional model you can, you can simulate or mimic the potential behaviours by running your finger on a table following the rule that you can't intersect any particular point you've already been through. And that means you have three potential uh, ways to go. You can converge to an equilibrium, 
You can diverge to falling off the edge of the table, a breakdown, getting unrealistic system values, or you can get a limit cycle. Those are the three, the only three possibilities. Once you get above 3D, you start working in a cubic and hypercube, hypercube space where you do the same thing, but in a three or four dimensional space, or five or six, whatever it is, and you can do, if you just imagine moving your finger in a three dimensional box, you can go anywhere. Okay? It'll be constrained by the overall dynamics, but there, that is the basis of why three dimensions or above are essential to indicate what's actually happening in a complex system. Now, the particular chaotic process that this model behaves uh, follows is called the pomeau manaville or inverse tangent route to chaos, and it was first identified in the behaviour of fluids in particular in the, in the Lorenz model of fluid dynamics. And what you get is either convergence to equilibrium or apparently diminishing cycles. So in fluid dynamics, that's going from turbulence to laminar flow, followed by turbulence on the other side. And this, in our case, what we have in this model is apparent convergence of, of two of the variables, employment rate and wage share, looking right ahead towards the equilibrium, and then you diverge on the other side with increasing levels of debt. So this is looking at the model, the straight linear model, where I've set the parameters up so that we have a stable convergence, the employment rate, the profit rate, and what's going on in the background as well, the debt ratio reaching an equilibrium, in that case of 60% of GDP, when you graph it in three dimensions, that's your particular dynamic process you're going through. When you have it in, uh, in just to show this in terms of Minsky, the software package I've developed to actually indicate, uh, make it possible to do dynamic modelling. This is, this, if you haven't ever seen a software package like this before, there's dozens of them. I mean, maybe, maybe ten. What Minsky adds is the capacity to model using double entry bookkeeping. So I could do this with any of the other programs, but. Um, just to show you the dynamics, that's, that's the process where you've got the equilibrium applying because the variable that really matters here, or the parameter that matters, is the reaction capitalists have to the rate of profit. The more aggressive they are, uh, the, the more I get instability. So that's the stable equilibrium convergence case, <coughs> which is not what we've observed in the real world. Look at the real world, what we've seen is bubbles and crashes in debt, and you get that in this model by simply having a higher propensity to invest amongst the capitalists, and it generates the <laughs> phenomenon of falling and then rising cycles, which you cannot get out of a genuine linear superposition style model. The neoclassicals can't get there with DSGE. You get falling and rising cycles in the profit rate, and what's driving it in the background is rising level of private debt, rising in a cyclical fashion. And you put it together, and what you see in three dimensions is this remarkable shape not driven by any non-linearity in the functions now, but driven by the actual structure of the, the model. And that's stylized, but it's close to what we've seen in the real world. And it gives you rising inequality, an apparent great moderation, and then a breakdown. And when I put it together in again, another Minsky model, where I actually use it as a flowchart this time, so you can see the dynamics just rapidly, again given time here, you have investment giving you the level of capital stock, divided by accelerator relationship gives you output, divided by labour productivity gives you employment, divided by population gives you the employment rate, Phillips curve argument determining a wage, subtract the wage bill and interest from profits, from output you get profit, divide that by the capital stock you get the rate of profit, feed that into a linear investment function you get the level of gross investment, subtract depreciation down here you get net, up here, if investment exceeds desired and gross investment exceeds profits, you have to borrow money on which you pay interest. That's determined up here. That's the overall dynamics. I'm waiting for the system to rewrite itself and actually run it. It looks like it's not going to. So that particular instance of Minsky may have crashed. Uh, but that's that's the dynamics you get. Is to go back that again. That's what you see: diminishing cycles and then rising cycles on the other side. Here we go. It's working. Okay. You praise that it's working anyway. Okay. Ah, I see what's happened. By my chatting there, be careful with uh, when you're using Minsky. It's too sensitive sometimes. I actually whacked it, white wired that little element up there. That's why the particular model failed. It didn't even see I'd whack the wire in. So I've got to give that a miss and go on to the next, uh, next slide. Now, when you look at the dynamics here, you're bouncing between a, um, a curve and a straight line. This is the way it's described what's called a Poincaré map. And if, you, if the line intersects the curve, you get equilibrium and convergence to that over time. For non-intersection, you have apparently diminishing cycles and then rising again. So that's from the original Pomona Manaville paper. Now, 
when you look at the, the linear Phillips curve argument with, with uh, Goodwin, you get these two equilibrium states where they are the labour, the employment rate and the wage share of output. When you do the Minsky model, you no longer have the wage share of output as your system state, it's the profit rate. And this is an intriguing discovery. Wage share are a residual of the profit and debt share. And so that's in this case, it's the workers who pay for the rising level of debt, even though they're not borrowing any borrowing whatsoever. In a social sense, it's the workers who pay for the rising level of <coughs> Of, um, of debt and there is no tendency for the rate of profit to fall. There's a tendency for the rate of profit to cycle around or near an equilibrium until breakdown. Worker share being the residual, is that even though capitalists are the, are the borrowers, what you find is the key class struggle in capitalism is not between worker and capitalist, it's between worker and banker. And the capitalists are the last ones to know capitalism is about to come to an end because their income share appears constant or fluctuating around a constant level with rising banker share being offset by declining workers' share until we have a final collapse when the debt compounding overwhelms what's happening with workers' wages. So this is the sort of dynamic you see, and this is the, the full nonlinear model I'll show rapidly at the end there. Declining workers' share offset by rising banker's share and capitalists sitting in the middle don't think anything is wrong until, bang, the economy collapses. So you have to look at the... You, you, you can't uh, ignore income distribution. You, you've got to take a serious look at it. Now, the weakness of the model is that there's... It's a even side... So it's both booms and busts, when we know that isn't what actually happened. So it can be generalised to include the inflation rate. Given time, I won't spell that out completely. But I needed equations for the rate of, in rate of inflation, a variable nominal and a variable nominal interest rate. And I used the simplest possible relations again for that, just lag convergence. Once I'd done that, uh, I needed a price equation. And again, given time, I won't go into the details there. But the price equation is derived effectively by having a con lag convergence to equilibrium. When you work out the logic of that, and this is again with time I'd, I'd go through this more carefully, once you do it, you actually end up with Kolesky's pricing equation. So, in that sense, a monetary supply and demand equilib equilibration process is the same as Kolesky's markup equation, which was a surprise. I didn't expect that. Um, so, the equations here, again, I'll, I'll jump over them rapidly, but I'm just showing where inflation now turns up in those, at this stage, still identities. The full model. Looks messy, but it's only six, six, or I think there's six, uh, dif four differential equations to it, or five. Um, and just again, I'll be given time, I'll just rapidly let those bounce through and we'll whack the presentation up on my blog so you can actually download it if you like and see, see the models. Now, when I run the model, and this is the, uh, when I think it's actually, you can argue it captures not just the last five years, but perhaps the last 50, with an in still an incredibly simple model. If you simulate this model, you'll see the employment rate appears to be cycling down to stability, then starts to explode into more instability, then starts to reach to reach what it looks like equilibrium, and then the whole economy collapses. Again, doing that far too rapidly. But uh, that, that type of dynamic, I'll run it through again rather more slowly, is capturing both like a diminishing pair of cycles, which you might say the 50s and 60s, rising cycles, which you might see as the 70s and 80s, the stagflation period, then when it all appears to settle down, it's actually just probably into a collapse driven by a rising level of private debt to GDP. Again, all ignored by the mainstream. I've got one minute. Huh? I've got zero minutes to go. At that point, I'll stop and I'll hand over to my uh, colleague, Matthias. Thank you. Pardon? Yep. Can we a round of questions? Yep, sure. Yeah. In the Minsky model, usually you have that the expected profit affects current investment decision, mm -hmm. and current investment then validate past that decision. Yeah. I want to know how is how is possible to model the relation between expected profits and current investment. Well, I mean that's the basic thing I'm doing with my thing is simply saying capitalists extrapolate current conditions forward, which is fundamentally what Keynes argued about expectations in thirty six and thirty seven. So in that sense, they, their expectations of profit are based on extrapolations of current conditions. That's what I'm doing. Well, yeah. If your model is, is privileging a, a provision of a process of accumulation of debt and so on, yeah. and as you noted, uh, the wage share turns out to be to fall out, uh, so to speak, residually from other dynamics and processes. Yeah. So 
Could we say what, how, how would you talk about this model or put in terms of the kind of wage led versus profit led sort of discourse that's been, you know, that, that we've seen around, especially in some of the empirical models? I think it's, it's, it actually integrates them. Because you're, in, in a sense, I've seen people, and of course, Engelbert Stockham at my university does a lot of work on wage led versus profit led growth. And what I see they're doing is identifying different stages in the cyclical behaviour of the overall system. There will be periods where there'll be effectively wage led growth, there will be periods which there are profit led growth. There are different stages in that overall dynamic cycle. In that sense, this is also related to a predator-prey model, which is what Putin was originally trying to capture. And you will find times you might call in that system, you could say you've got a shark-led or a fish-led uh, process when you've got rising numbers of sharks and falling fish, etc., etc. Et it's just different stages in the overall integrated process. Yeah, but that, that, that's intracyclical, then, that variation. Yeah. While the speed and the instability of the capitalists being more nervous or more reactive or less reactive. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, Another question? Yeah. Did you have a question? What about the expectation of the relationship? Well, in a sense. How about that uh, expectation? And very simply, I and mean, this is, I actually had a, if this is worth relating, I submitted this model, the predecessor of this model, to the uh, American Economic Macro Journal and had it rejected by the editor, unrefereed, typical. However, he made the mistake of corresponding with me and in the correspondence criticised me for not having an argument about expectations. And I said, well, fundamentally expectations, uh, because we live in an uncertain environment, you have to, you, what we do, as Keynes argued quite eloquently, we, we, ex we project forward what's currently happening, whether that's a boom or a bust. And then, of course, the dynamics of the system under, under right, undermine those expectations. It turns out differently. But that's how we behave. Now, in kidding that, he, he, he saw that as a lousy basis for talking about expectations and carried on a bit further about people being rational, or yada, yada, yada. And I, at one point, made, I was being quite uh, rude, which is unusual for me, I know, <laughs> but still. And um, it, in, in reaction at one stage, he said, oh, but what if they, and I'm not joking, this is a direct quote, what if they get more information about the future? How will that change things? Only a neoclassical can believe that there's such a thing as information about the future. He's got God. Huh? He's got God. God. That's what I tell you. There's only two rational people in the universe, God and Nostradamus. <laughs> Unfortunately, they wrote different books. <laughs> Another question, please? Investment minus profits, yeah. Yeah. And funnily enough, and this is another remarkable thing, I, some neoclassicals do decent work by accident on occasions, and one of those accidents was work by Famer and French, where they looked at what were the main determinants of corporate investment, and they found this is a set of one unpublished paper, unfortunately, which has also disappeared from the web, but there's another published version which has got part of it. They concluded precisely that argument empirically. They found a correlation between long-term debt and uh, level of invest change in long-term debt and level of investment at 0.79 by looking at the CompuStat database for America, which is a comprehensive record of about you know, 500 or 1,000 corporations. So their ar argument was that change in uh, investment uh, increases debt and profit reduces it. It's exactly the equation I used. They did that work in about 2000, about eight years after this model was built. And we have the last question, please. Maybe we give Matthias more time. I'm happy to get out of the chair. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm calling upon Matthew Spencer from Queen's Institute with the paper Inequality and Monetary Macrodynamics. All yours. Jack, Jack, Jack. Oh, thank you. How do we make it full screen? Oh, how do you do that? Do this is the new version of uh, you. Let's see. Full screen mode. Oh, no, no, full screen mode. Screen mode. Yeah, okay. Right.
Thank you very much. Uh, I, I should say we planned this session as a, a truly joint session, so we actually uh, exchanged uh, emails on how we would structure and so on. So uh, you should see it as a continuation of the presentation. Uh, so, but but the paper is based on joint work with uh, Gael Giro, who is going to give the last part of of the session, and it's a, a contribution to the debate uh, uh, around the work of uh, uh, PKT. So that's the book, and that's the man. Uh, of course, uh, very well known here in France. Uh, wasn't that well known in, in North America before, but became a superstar after the book was <coughs> launched. Um, myself, I first met uh, Thomas uh, this year at the INET conference in uh, Paris in, in early this year, in May, I think. Uh, the theme of the conference was economics of inequality. Uh, the banquet for this conference is going to be very grand. It's going to be in a chateau, I understand. Uh, the banquet for that conference in Paris was uh, sponsored by George Soros, and it was in the Opéra Garnier. We had the entire opera house closed for us, and we're yeah, sipping, sipping champagne and uh, uh, eating foie gras and discussing inequality. Uh, <laughs> the, the joke writes itself. Uh, how did you feel? <laughs> we, we, we felt bad. Yes, inequality is a bitch. Uh, so here's a flash uh, review of uh, PKT. Um, Gael is going to go into more details, but you know what, what it's coming. Uh, when I started uh, reading the book, uh, I've, right at the beginning, there's uh, this uh, statement that uh, economics has yet to get over its childish passion for mathematics. Uh, and as a mathematician, I thought, oh, this is going to be fun. Uh, so I read with even more interest. Uh, and uh, his methodology is really to, to look at uh, empirical regularities in, in long time series and then try to, to get some insights from it. And the empirical regularities are the ones that you're familiar with. Uh, but before we go to that let me put some key definitions there. He divides uh, total income into labor income and then the residual, that's then capital income, uh, whatever is left after you subtract labor income. The rate of return on capital is then the income that you get from capital divided by the amount of capital that you have um, with a price uh, index suitably defined. Uh, the capital share of income then is the part of the total income that goes into capital income. So this is all just a simple of definitions. Uh, I call alpha K, uh, he calls alpha in the book, but I'm going to have a different alpha in the presentation, uh, so I just put alpha K. And the capital to income ratio is just the total amount of capital, which is the stock of capital in the economy, divided by the uh, uh, yearly uh, uh, GDP, so yearly income. And that's uh, beta in the book, and I call it beta K in here. And then he goes on to show how these things evolve over time. Uh, so, for example, for uh, output itself, he, he goes, he computes output growth for uh, a very long period, going from antiquity to the present. Uh, the uh, return on capital has some remarkable regularity, at least for the past 200 years. Uh, the capital share, which is, if you follow my mini course, if you're in the uh, winter sc uh, school, is, the, is one minus the wage share, and uh, the Goodwin model predicts this sort of cyclical wage share. You're seeing one minus that in this uh, figure, so when I was reading the book, I thought, oh, okay, well, I, I recognize this uh, regularity. There's something to be said in here. Uh, the capital to income ratio used to be very large and then decreased mostly because of uh, wiping out capital through uh, major wars and, and the depression, but then it's building up again. This is in Britain. Uh, and then he makes the argument. He wants to, to discuss inequality. So the argument uh, goes, he puts forward the uh, so-called first law of capitalism, which is uh, really an accounting identity. You start with the uh, 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 in, uh, capital uh, income share uh, divided and multiplied by the amount of capital and you have the rate of return ca on capital times the capital to income ratio. So you cannot argue with this law, it's just, a, it's just an identity. Uh, what he calls the second law of capitalism is a little more uh, you know, elaborate. It's first of all an asymptotic relationship saying that this capital to income ratio converges to the ratio of savings in the economy divided by the growth rate and then to justify that, there's all sorts of, uh, you know, nebulous uh, neoclassical arguments going on in the book. And then says, therefore, based on these two laws plus some hand-waving, um, if the uh, rate of uh, return on capital is greater than the growth rate in the economy, wealth and income inequality tend to increase in time. And yeah, as a mathematician, I was uh, hooked in the word therefore. Uh, you know, it's, it's just, it reminded me a lot of uh, South Park and that episode where the gnome 
means they steal underwear and then they make profits. And here's their business plan. Phase one, collect underpants. Phase two, question mark. Phase three, profits. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's my uh, 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 interpretation of Piketty's argument. There's a huge question mark there in the middle that I think uh, Gael is going gonna, is gonna to explore a little bit more. Uh, so, and, and then he en ends the book with this uh, very big uh, rhetorical uh, flourish. Uh, you know, a good writer and the translator was very good, uh, but saying that, uh, you know, if this happens, then uh, accumulated uh, wealth accumulation in the past grows more rapidly than output and wages, and so on and so forth. Uh, capital reproduces itself faster than output increases. The past devours the future. You've got to give credit. It's, it's good rhetoric. Uh, but then what I wanted to do, what Gael and I wanted to do is, uh, you know, this is the uh, defining issue of our era. Uh, if we can say uh, something uh, intelligent about it with other techniques, uh, with different types of models, then we should. So, so I say, is there anything that we could do, for example, uh, in the context of uh, different dynamical models, uh, such as the Keen model? Now, uh, I usually have to uh, spend a lot of time explaining the Keen model when I give presentations like this, uh, but Steve Keen just explained explain. It's just like the Woody Allen movie where he pulls Marshall McLuhan from the head. You know, I have, happen to have Steve Keen here to explain the model to me. Uh, so, so we don't need to spend time on that, but uh, I will uh, talk... Okay, so that's the criticism that will come later through uh, Gael. Oh, and a bunch of more uh, pictures from Piketty. I say, uh, despite the criticism, there is something going on. There is uh, the uh, increase in capital to income ratio uh, throughout time. Uh, the uh, return on capital has been greater than G for most of the time, except for some uh, abnormal periods, and now it's going uh, higher than G again. And, and inequality is increasing. So there is something to be explained. I, I skipped these graphs because you know uh, very well and you have seen them all. Uh, and, and then this is the really obnoxious one where, you know, the fraction of inherited uh, wealth uh, for a given cohort uh, is, uh, you know, this, this graph should be read like this. In 1970, 12% uh, of uh, uh, the cohort born in that year uh, has inherited wealth equal to the lifetime earnings of 50% of the population, and this is going up, right? So that's the thing that you should be worried about. Uh, so uh, onto the model. Uh, what, what we're tr trying to do here is a, what we call a dual keen model. So everything that Steve was explaining was uh, where the essential engine of the of the model was the investment from the firms. He mentioned it several times, and the uh, households uh, had a passive role. So the households were a residual variable. Uh, this is a long-term model. So eventually, consumption of the households adjusts to the level that they have to be, so that there's no difference in in, in uh, uh, output. Uh, so C uh, so. C adjusts so that Y equals C plus I in the model. Uh, here we are doing the, the dual of that. So we forget about investment. So we, we put ourselves in a situation where investment adjusts. So think of a very uh, <coughs> well-managed uh, uh, supply chain management uh, structure where you can have investment on demand. You produce whatever is necessary. It's the households that are the uh, uh, engine for this model. Uh, so uh, this is in the context of stock flow consistent models. The students who in the mini course uh, should be familiar with it. You first specify the balance sheets for the different uh, sectors in the economy. Uh, financial uh, assets cancel out and you're left out with the net worth, the wealth. This is the capital that Piketty is talking about in his book. Uh, and then uh, transactions are the stuff that make you change positions in balance sheets. And then transactions are always things that go from one sector to another. And we're going to be primarily uh, occupied with uh, consumption and the relationship between consumption consumption and wages that are received and the wealth that the uh, households have. Uh, once you go down a column uh, like here, you have a financial balance at the end, and now what you have to do is divide up the financial balance into the possible investment uh, instruments that are available to you, for example, deposits, loans, <laughs> and even more accumulation of capital if you happen to have capital. Uh, so, so this is just to set up the model in a stock flow consistent way. Uh, 
the essential difference between this model and the model that Steve presented is that the change in debt here is debt of households, and it's not given as in the previous model as the uh, difference between investment and profits. There, the uh, uh, firms, if they wanted to invest more than what they earn in profits, they had to borrow. Here, the change in debt uh, is given by the difference between consumption and uh, wages that are received uh, with the uh, uh, addition of the interest that needs to be paid in debt, in the existing debt. Uh, this is the wage share, this is the debt uh, ratio as in the previous model. Uh, uh, consumption now is a function of the variables that are available to households, namely their uh, disposable income. Uh, uh, as in the other model, investment was a function of profits. Uh, now, you, you, this is the part that investment adjusts as consumption adjusted before in the previous model, and then you have the accumulation of capital given by the equation uh, shown there. Uh, we need to make a few more assumptions, as Steve mentioned, for example, for the uh, uh, way uh, wages are bargained. So this, uh, we, we follow uh, extensions of the Goodwin model, for example, by Desai, where uh, the uh, wages are adjusted by a uh, Phillips curve that depends on, on the level of employment. The more employed people, the more bargaining power uh, uh, workers have, uh, plus an item that takes care of uh, inflation. And then this uh, uh, coefficient here is the money illusion, how well uh, inflation changes are incorporated in wage bargaining. And inflation itself has a dynamics in the uh, post-Keynesian tradition of being uh, just a markup over uh, unit cost. So this is labor cost, you, you have a, a, a target markup M, and if your prices are below uh, the target markup times unit cost, prices go up, if they're above, they go down. So it's a lagged adjustment to a desired uh, markup uh, times unit cost. Uh, uh, with, the, with the inclusion of these equations, uh, I disagree with Steve here, it act, the model doesn't increase, it's, it's still three-dimensional because these are sort of auxiliary equations. You can solve this equation separately and feed it into the equation for inflation and see where inflation is going to adjust. So it's actually simpler than what he was uh, presenting. Uh, but it, it is uh, then I, sort of isomorphic to the original Keen model, and in particular it has uh, the features that, that uh, uh, people who have studied the model and, and took it to other extensions are really uh, familiar and, and excited about, which are that there are two uh, essential uh, equilibria. There are a couple of other equilibria that you can uh, uh, disregard because they're structurally unstable. They depend on very precise relationships between constants and they, they are very uh, 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 unlikely to hold in reality. But they are uh, equilibria that you cannot disregard. And one of them is the one that you want to achieve. is an equilibrium where wages have a, a well-defined level, employment has a well-defined level, and debt has a finite level. Uh, and then you can modify the parameters and modify policies to see where this equilibrium is going to be. But dynamically, that's where you want to, to, to be. Uh, but the other equilibrium is equally, uh, well, not equally, it's also uh, stable, uh, but it, it, it's not uh, a what I call good equilibrium, it's a bad equilibrium. Um, at one point, we, we identified several equilibria that are really ugly to write down, and we're going to write a paper about the good, the bad, and the ugly, but uh, we decided that it was too much. But, but nevertheless, we have the good equilibrium and the bad equilibrium, which uh, lives in the boundary of the system and corresponds to that going to infinity. Uh, so, so we did a lot of work in, uh, in characterizing the basin of attraction of these uh, two equilibria, and, and it turns out that this model also uh, uh, exhibits this behavior. And then uh, when uh, Gael and, our, and I found that out, we thought, okay, this is kind of cute, because now we can see, uh, suppose that inequality has something to do with the bad equilibrium. Okay, okay, but then to talk about inequality, how much do I have? That's exactly what I need. Uh, to talk about inequality, uh, it's, it's kind of odd, uh, like in Piketty's book, if you, it's essentially based on a representative agent uh, model. And, and it's, it's very hard to understand inequality if you just have one guy. So it means, you know, part of your life is poor and part of your life is rich. Uh, so, so similarly here, you, you need to uh, 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 divide up the household class, which we incorporated <laughs> into just one sector, uh, to, you, you need to separate. So we are going to do a model now where you have uh, 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 low income and high income households. And, and the dividing feature here is going to be, oh, okay, so this is the good equilibrium, I already mentioned that. The dividing feature, feature here is who owns wealth. 
So, you know, one of the reviews of PKJ says that, uh, you know, it's not that far-fetched to just say that there is a class that owns all the wealth and there is a class that only has debt. And if you look at the actual distribution, you know, you just keep going. If the top 10% have the 76% of the wealth in America, you keep going a little bit, and you see the bottom 40% actually own nothing, but they have uh, debt. They, they only have liabilities. And that's what we do. We say that the, uh, there is uh, uh, workers, and the only wealth that the workers have are their deposits uh, and loans. And then if their loans are greater than deposits, then they have uh, debt, and the negative debt is the wealth. Uh, and uh, investors. Now, investors have two classes of assets to go to, the deposits and loans, but also uh, stocks. They are the owners of shares for uh, capital. Uh, so that's what constitutes wealth for investors. Uh, therefore, now you have the change in debt for both uh, uh, workers and investors, except that the income for workers is just wages. The income for investors is dividend on the capital that they already have. Uh, now, consumption has got to be different, and, and you include consumption of both uh, as a function of income, disposable income for each of those two classes, and wealth. So for workers, uh, a high debt will make them uh, slow down in consumption. For investors, a high amount of wealth is going to make their consumption go uh, a bit higher. Uh, the propensity to spend also in a post-Keynesian uh, tradition is going to be that uh, uh, low-income uh, uh, households have a higher propensity to spend out of income. Uh, you, you go through the math and now genuinely you have a higher dimensional system because you have to keep track of these two separate classes and this is the debt uh, uh, ratio of uh, workers and the debt ratio of uh, investors and characteristically you still have a good equilibrium where all these uh, uh, ratios go to a finite value but you have a bad equilibrium where wages go to zero employment goes to zero and the level of debt for uh, uh, the different classes can go to plus or minus infinity, I think this is one is for, uh, I think I uh, inverted the order of variables, the uh, debt of, uh, no, no, that's correct, because debt is minus wealth. So debt of the workers always goes to plus infinity, the debt of the uh, investors can go to either plus or minus infinity. Uh, and then uh, here is really my last slide. Uh, you can look at the growth rate of uh, 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 income for workers and the growth rate of income for uh, investors, uh, depending on you know where they get their uh, income, wages minus paying interest, and here they get the uh, income from uh, 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 capital gains plus uh, uh, <laughs> dividends, and and you see that in the good equilibrium, do both of these uh, incomes uh, grow at the same rate asymptotically, and that's the growth rate of the economy. So that's where you uh, would like to 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 achieve some sort of a, a, a stable ratio of income between uh, workers and investors. But, however, at the bad equilibrium, even disregarding the uh, interest that are paid or received in debt, just for the part of income, the uh, sort of uh, gross income, not looking at payment and receiving in debt, uh, what you have is that if wages are being compressed to zero, then the... Uh, uh, income ratio diverges. So uh, what we say, uh, or oh, and there's a further extension of the model. Uh, if I have 30 seconds, I haven't been given haven't been given the zero yet, so the, haven't reached the zero lower bound. Uh, the oh now I am. Uh, so, so I'm going to do the sort of zero lower bound like Krugman calls it. Uh, the, you, you can even introduce a further uh, degree of instability in this model by having investment by uh, the uh, high income class uh, to, to be sort of a self-motivator. It's an endogenous portfolio selection that depends on the expected return on the capital that you're making. And if capital is growing at a high rate, you're going to be uh, uh, buying more and that's going to be pushing the, the uh, 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 nominal price of those shares uh, even higher. Uh, so this has the effect uh, equivalent of a Ponzi scheme in the original Keen model uh, and it makes the good equilibrium less stable and the bad equilibrium more stable. So what we did is to have a stock flow consistent model for uh, the dynamics of that for workers and investors and uh, what we want to emphasize is that th we're not saying that one thing happens or the other thing happens. What we're saying is that this is now a signature uh, of convergence to the bad equilibrium. So put the logic uh, upside down, and if you do observe uh, income uh, divergence, uh, then that's, a, that's an indication that uh, what you're doing is really uh, progressing to the bad equilibrium, and you should take uh, measures to
to avoid it. And this is a, a relic of this talk that I gave last week in Rio. It says, obrigado, I should have a t change to merci. Thank you very much. Have some questions, partial questions, because at the end we will have okay, three of them. Yes, Sorry? Any simulations as yet? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, Gael, Gael has a little army of uh, students here in uh, France uh, doing the simulation, so uh, it's coming. Good. <laughs> Yes. Very good. I, I, I very much welcome. Uh, you, you know, my, my my blind spot is the lack of uh, uh, training in in, po in economics in general, and post case in economics in particular. So this always happens. I submit a paper, and then they say, "Well, but so and so and so and so and so have done that." And then I learn a lot, and 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 hopefully, that's the hope. The paper still has something uh, new to say. Yeah. But please, yeah, let's uh, give me more of the references and they'll be totally acknowledged. Yes. There is also something that we have that I don't think is in the cognitive work, which is the fact that one condition for the written stability of the value for one, for an equality in Queen, is the famous inequality R bigger than Z. That is missing the same factor. So here, we recover this inequality as being one necessary condition for the stability of the value for one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is another necessary condition to do well in economics is to have an economist co author because they will know the references. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
you want to start to have models of X and equality, uh, then we need process, then we need more things um, to, you know, to break out of the box. Uh, we need some social relations in there. And of course, we really got not in there. So I would say almost like it would be simple. And of course, if you send this to a, it would be an interesting provocation. Because all of the work that Pikiti and Saeed and them did that, that was published was empirical work. It's, it's what he does his book, which is this sort of, you know, complex combination of historical references, long time theories, playing around with numbers, and then this suggestive but ultimately empty mathematics um, that, that makes you think when he flipped, but that's never been put up to the test. So it would be interesting to see, to just to, to read this, I think, as a kind of and then to open the door and then to say now let's go to proper uh, some other things but that will maybe be other projects you, you, you're very right. So, so this is an open enough doors to include more uh, uh, sort of a well uh, sound uh, uh, economic theory because uh, Piketty is not only empty in mathematics; it's empty on the on the economics, so to speak. Right? The uh, the uh, um, growth model is the solo model, and so on and so forth. He's a man without a home right now. He says he's interested in solo model, but he's undermining it. He's not. He, you know, he makes his reference to some historical figures and econometrics and blah, blah, blah. But basically, he then says that everything at MIT is dumb and limited and I want to be a philosopher. So if the man is looking for a home, I say let's push him off the cliff. Correct. <laughs> and, and then, and then uh, accept him. <laughs> Somebody else, please? If not, we stand. Thank you. Uh, 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 Bring up yours. Can I which work is on That's it. Correct. Okay. okay. Gael you Gael full screen. From C N R S. Yes. <coughs> the name of the paper is sorting out the get view of capital. So thank you. Please so go thank ahead. You. I will subtract it. Okay. So I have the very bad duty to try to criticize my uh, colleague and classmate, uh, Thomas Piketty, and this is, I mean, your question is an excellent transition to this. So, <coughs> um, let me start by just re recalling what all of you know now, and I'm going to use the notations that are used by Thomas, not the notations that were used by uh, Matthäus, even though the notations by Matthäus are better. So this is just to not to create some confusion. So KT is capital, and as you know, Piketty is confusing, conflating capital with everything that is a net marketed wealth. <coughs> you don't listen to me? I'm sorry, I don't have voice. <coughs> so beta is the capital to output ratio. Alpha is the share of capital income in national income. R is the so-called pure rate of capital return. So it's not to be confused with what we call in our paper the short-run interest rate. But of course, in his book and also in his papers, Thomas is always confusing both, doing as if, as any neoclassical economist, as if the you know the real the, the rental rate of capital would be equal to the short-run interest rate. And YT is a net income without depreciation rate. So, as was recalled by um, Matthews, the first fundamental law of cap capitalism is just a tautology. Uh, and the second from its fundamental law of capitalism says that the capital to output ratio, beta, should converge in the very long run to the ratio between the saving rate, small s, divided by the um, real growth rate of income. So the starting point of Piketty's interpretation of his own book is to say, I'm going to get, get rid of Caldo's facts because we know I observed that Alpha is not constant across time, and it's even growing, and beta is doing the same. So let's give up Caldo's facts and start something new. So this you know. Then, <coughs> in his paper with uh, Zuckman, uh, they are trying to give some flesh to the second law, beta equals S divided by G, and they try to give to, to show that there is some empirical evidence showing that this law makes sense. The first uh, remark to be done is that this flow is always wrong in the short run. So they don't claim to have a law that would be instantaneously true. 
Then what they say is that, oh, okay, we don't observe this law in the short run because there is money in the real world while we are dealing with a real model, the standard solo model, where there is no money. So we have to watch, you know, the very long run where money disappears. So which means that they're assuming implicitly that money is neutral in the long run, that we can do as if we were dealing with a non, with a real economy without money, and that the housing bubble, which explains most of the increase of inequality in wealth that is observed by uh, Cleary, that this would just be a catch-up process. This you see uh, here. So here you have <coughs> the real price of real estate in the U.S. In, uh, at the end of the 19th century. It's, this is the Second World War. And here you have the big bubble that Ben Bernanke didn't see, you remember? And so here you are, you are seeing that they are almost converting back to the starting point here. And essentially what Piketty and Zuckman do is to explain that this shows that we can neglect the evolution of the dynamics of real estate prices. Everything goes as if the real estate prices wouldn't matter in the very long run from an economic viewpoint. <coughs> um, so nevertheless, if they just focus on the, the sh medium period, you know, medium run period, 1970 to 2000, then this second law explains only 60% of the evolution of beta. This is their knowledge. <coughs> and then they say, okay, beta overestimates um, what we observe in the US by uh, 25% and uh, underestimates it by 25% in Germany. So, in fact, they are themselves acknowledging that this law doesn't work, empirically speaking. Then the question we could ask is, uh, do they have a story to tell us how we converge to this identity, beta converging to S divided by G? This would refer to something like a transitional dynamics a la solo, since the model, the model they have in mind is solo growth model, but they never talk about this transitional dynamics. So everything goes as if they would believe that we are, since the 19th century, in a very long run sta steady state that has been perturbed from time to time by money, by some wars, by some institutional shocks, but uh, I mean, uh, there is a kind of miracle. Today we can observe the truth of economics, that is, we recover apparently this law in the very long run because it turns, it turns out that everything uh, cancels so that we can see the identity beta equal S divided by G. So in fact, the kind of storyline they have in mind is exactly the one that was put forward by Caldor at his time. He never claimed that alpha is constant over time. He said alpha is in the long run constant, and from time to time it's perturbed by some shocks, external shocks. So in fact, they want to get rid of Caldor's fact, but they are duplicating exactly the same kind of methodology. Um, now, of course, there is another big problem which is uh, <coughs> related to the, f the way that uh, Piketty defines capital, as you know. Uh, which refers to the fact that he claims that <coughs> the outcome of the big uh, Cambridge capital controversy was that the Americans were right, and as you know, they were wrong, and they even themselves acknowledged that they were wrong, compare the, the, the paper by uh, Samuelson himself, okay? But apparently he ignores this, so I'm going to go quickly. Um, and that's why I think that the suggestion made by Yanis Varoufakis in his own paper on Thomas Book, which is he should change the title from the, the capital to the wealth of nations would be much better because what he's analyzing is not capital, productive capital, but wealth, okay? Confusing both, okay? And explaining how wealth evolves. <coughs> now, the, the storyline of Thomas' essential argument is, it goes as follows. So G, the growth rate of, of outcome, uh, should be very weak in the near future. The, the saving rate should be constant. Uh, so beta, if you believe in the second law, which as we know, as we saw, doesn't have any empirical uh, support, uh, beta equal S divided by G means that beta is going to increase uh, up to, let's say, 6 or even 10. The increase of beta should imply the increase of the rental rate of capital. This is what Thomas claims, and we're going to see that it doesn't work. This increase itself implies that alpha, the share of income, of capital income over a global income, should increase. And finally, this increase itself should induce some political instability. So, as we just saw, I mean, the first item in this storyline uh, refers to the second law of capitalism, the second fundamental law of capitalism, which doesn't work and doesn't have any empirical support. 
Um, another way to interpret it is to say that if the ratio between saving and capital is greater than the, the growth rate of the economy, G, then beta should increase. This is essentially equivalent to the way I just formulated this law, but this is true only under the condition that <coughs> that the change in capital is exactly equal to saving. This looks like the, the, the accounting equation investment equals saving. Once you reinterpret the standard accumulation equation of capital in the way I did it, and you assume that del delta is equal to zero. So if you put depreciation rate equal to zero, and you say investment is equal to saving, then you get this equation, which is needed for this second interpretation of the second law of capital. Mm -hmm. That's why it seems to me Thomas needs to neglect the depreciation rate, as he, d as he does in his book and in, in the paper with uh, Zuckman. But as was observed by Kuzel and Smith, if you interpret everything I just mentioned so far as being net quantities, net of depreci depreciation, then when the, the, the growth rate of the economy goes to zero, if you don't want beta to increase to infinity, you need it. The saving rate has to go to zero as well, which is not consistent with the fact that he assumes throughout the book and his papers that S should be constant. So there is a also a problem in the fact that he's assuming everything being net of depreciation, which is not consistent with the kind of story he wants to tell us. And of course, this equation assumes to begin with that there is no money creation. So the, the unique change you have in wealth, if you reinterpret capital as being wealth, is just due to the saving of uh, households or firms. Okay? Now, second, does the, the famous equation R bigger than G imply in itself the divergence between capital and labor incomes? The answer is no. Um, Asimoglu, this is a small paper he wrote to criticize Piggy's paper, Piggy's book, shows that it's easy to show that. The real equation you should have is this one, slightly more complicated than R bigger than G. Now, if you suppose that the, the saving rate is 100%, and you put delta equals 0, then you get, you get R bigger than G. So, R bigger than G implies what Piketty wants to have as a consequence, namely the explosion of uh, income inequality, only if you have no consumption on the side of capitalists and uh, a constant interest rate, <coughs> which of course is not true. Then second, uh, I mean third, um, the, the second item in the storyline is uh, an increase in beta should imply an increase in the interest rate. Of course, this is also very hard to explain because Thomas on the one hand is claiming that he believes in the law of diminishing returns of capital, and at the same time, if beta increases, he claims that R should increase, which is self-contradictory. So for that, in this, in this area, um, he uses uh, this, uh, the, the idea that he claims to have a proof of the fact that the long-run elasticity between capital and labor should be greater than one. Probably you know also this part of the debate. So if you, I mean, one way to, un to understand it is to go back to my storyline here, and you see that this implication is very problematic. So why not try to prove that if beta increases, then this is the alpha will increase without saying anything about R, because as you know, if you believe in the law of diminishing returns, which I don't, but which Piketty claims he does, then you have a problem. So in other way, in other in other words, what he wants to prove is that it makes sense to assume that as soon as beta increases, alpha should increase. Okay? So for that purpose, he, cl he postulates that the production function of the economy is a CS function, and that you can get, as of, uh, looking at the first order condition, this kind of equation, which relates alpha and beta. But for alpha and beta to move at unis uh, in unison, meaning when, when one increases, the other increases as well, you need here the elasticity epsilon to be greater than one, okay? And that's why he needs to prove or to claim to prove that the elasticity between of substitution between capital and labor in the long run is greater than one. Okay? How does he prove this? Um, you will probably laugh. <coughs> he write again the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor. You do some standard algebra and you find this. Okay? And he says, well, I observe that between from the 70s until today, alpha and beta moved together. Therefore, 
It must be the case that the elasticity of substitution is greater than one, and therefore they move together throughout history. You see what I mean? Which is, of course, not a proof of anything. But it's the unique way I can understand the, the, the circle of his explanation with quotation marks. And of course, to go back to this, when he writes the first order condition of the production <coughs> function here, he, assu he assumes implicitly says law and uh, the absence of uh, involuntary unemployment, which is well known to people here. Um, now, there is, a, so uh, as you saw, I just mentioned a few papers which are criticizing uh, Piketty's book. So he's criticized from his left and his right. So Asimoglu, who is, who is probably on the right of Piketty, is criticizing his book saying R bigger than J does not imply what you believe it implies. And on the other hand, someone like Varoufakis, who certainly lies on his left, is also criticizing his book saying, for instance, you, you are just making a big confusion between capital and wealth. Now, <coughs> there is also a very interesting paper by Joe Stiglitz, uh, who, as you know, uh, we emphatically uh, <coughs> defended Piketty's book one year ago, and now who is also criticizing this book. So I, I don't enter into again, again into the, this criticism. Just want to mention the new quotation marks, stylized facts that Joe is claiming we should now uh, try to explain. So the growing inequality between capital incomes and wages, the fact that uh, average wages have stagnated in the last decades, the fact that alpha increased, the increase in beta, wealth output ratio, and the fact that the return to capital has not declined. So these are the four major stylized facts that Stiglitz, nevertheless, thinks we should now study and explain uh, in our models. And as you have understood, I mean, the, 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 the very poor theory of uh, Piketty is not able to, to do it. So essentially, the paper that was presented by Matthäus is a first step towards this research program. What we try to do is to find a, a truly dynamic stock flow consistent monetary macroeconomic model, which can be empirically estimated and simulated. This is important because if you read the beautiful PhD uh, manuscript by uh, Antonin Poitier, who is sitting over there, he's, he's mentioning the fact that many economists, you know, they have a story and they have a model. The model is never empirically estimated, never go to the data. It's just a kind of illustration of the story but of course the hermeneutics, the, the links between the story and the model itself is problematic. So it's as if everything goes as if the model would just be a way to impress a number of readers and to tell them, don't ask stupid questions, I'm so strong, you know, believe me, believe my story, you don't understand the math, so just believe my story. So if we, don't, we want to avoid this kind of rhetoric, we need to go to the data. On this issue, there is a paper by Matthäus, which is still in preparation, I guess, and also <coughs> a paper by Florent, who is somewhere over there, on the way we could estimate, empirically speaking, uh, Steve's uh, model. Okay, we need also this model to have to exhibit non-neutral money, and possibly also endogenous money creation. This is this is done in a, in a paper with uh, Torre Kokon, who is also sitting over there. Um, as I said, Piketty is assuming to begin to begin with that there is never involuntary unemployment in his model, so we should of course include it, but this is known since a long time. We should also be able to say that financial crashes can be the source of real shocks. So this is done also in a paper from Matthäus and uh, <coughs> Adrien, and also in, in my paper with Sartori. And of course we should show that uh, we can explain Stiglitz's new stylus facts. And this is exactly, I mean, we could do it with the paper that was presented by Matthäus, essentially by saying, if we are in the basis of attraction of the bad equilibrium, then all the new, the four new status facts that are uh, described by uh, Stiglitz, okay. So they can be interpreted as being, as you said, by Matthäus, the signature of the fact that we are converging to, towards a very bad equilibrium. And um, to the best of my knowledge, this is one point I want to uh, emphasize here. This provides a link between inefficiency and inequality. That is, you, sh you have to, to, to fight against inequality not just because you think it's just, which is also a, already a good reason, but because you know, if you believe in this kind of theory, that this leads to a very inefficient equilibrium. Okay? And of course, this, this breaks with two centuries of tradition uh, that probably were initiated by probably Ricardo and, uh, and Smith, trying to convince you that we can 
you know, study economics without asking the question about redistribution, because growth on the one hand and redistribution on the other hand are two separate topics. Thank you very much. The floor is open to question now. We have a problem of limitation. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? You're so hungry. <laughs> Just on the um, the final slide, they talk about. Uh, can I bring up the final slide? Uh, this one. Yeah, we're talking about the CES production function. Yes. So what's the, the good? Thank you. Yeah, the point is that so far everything that was shown to you deals with the Leon self collection function yeah. where there is no substitutability between capital and labor. Yeah. My suggestion is that we is that we should also look at a version where you have a CS collection function. Yeah. With there is where there might be some substitutability. The question is how do you plug it into yeah. the your dynamics? Yeah. And my suggestion is to to keep with this. So you don't claim that wages are the outcome of the maximum profit maximization program of anybody. Yeah. You keep with this, and you just say that capital and labor adjust so as to, max to, to fulfill the first order condition of the profit maximization program of the CS production function, yeah. given wages and given prices. Okay. Which seems to me to be a kind of analog of the, uh, you know, the basic rationality requirement we have in the Leon Chef model, yeah. where you assume that you are always on the first diagonal. Yeah. You, you don't waste your capital, you don't waste your labor. So in the same way here, suppose you give, suppose wages are given and prices are given by these two dynamics. Yeah. So I just assume that the production, uh, production sector will adjust capital and labor so as to minimize its cost, and you get an endogenously defined quantity of labor and capital. And, and you also do that with a, with a variable capacity utilization yeah, function. Yeah, sure. And so that you also want to do with energy as well. That comes out of the first order Okay. So the capital, the capital to output ratio is out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 The yeah. capital to output right. ratio now is endogenously defined, is not constant. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, of course, as you can imagine, if you go to the data, this model fits much better than data than the Leon CF model. Which Even yeah. though what, what we observe is that the uh, elasticity is very small. Yeah. So you are very close to the Leon CF model. Yeah. But nevertheless, the small change A makes better yeah, yeah. much better fit. Um, yeah. Some valid questions seem impressive. The objective was the first one to bring inequality or to raise the issue of inequality, as this is the part of the world that I live. But still, we haven't spoken very much about the right of protection, which is kind of see that. Yeah, just a, a question about the relation you. To say uh, from beta to to R. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think in in a uh, in it doesn't say that uh, R increases uh, with beta. So well, it because uh, well, so yes. Uh, there are two two things. For Pigetti, I think R is uh, exhaust, uh, It's not in the model. It's a uh, parameter. It's uh, exhaustion. Uh, we only say that if you're in terms of increasing return. Uh, to of the decreasing return. Yeah, the decreasing. Return. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but that's problematic for him. So if you look at the, I can give you the pages in the book. So he says, of course, there are diminishing returns to scale, but at the same time, he needs to be able to say the increase of beta does not imply a decrease of R. Then he says, I can prove that even though R should decrease, it will not decrease, in the very beautiful rhetoric that he is finding with you. So that's why, nevertheless, I mean, I can find to you the quotations if you want. He really claims that we could have something like what I wrote here. And of course, this doesn't fit with his model. So he doesn't, he never writes the equation, okay? And uh, at the same time, sometimes he says, well, alpha and beta goes together in unison, and that's the most yeah. important. Okay? I think he said that uh, when you study the front, the university front, he said that the more the greater is the front, the, the more rentability there is in the front. But uh, it doesn't say it, is, it, it, it only works for, for individual front. But at the, uh, the macro level, I think he said uh, that he did. 
No, I mean, in a sense, you are right because he is always saying. I mean, he's very often saying two th- two things which are contradictory at the same time in different pages. So on the one hand, he will claim that there are at the aggregate level diminishing returns to scale. On the other hand, he will say, oh, you know, there are a number of situations like university funds where there are increasing returns to scale. And by the way, beta is increasing, and I don't think that R is decreasing, even though if you believe in diminishing returns to scale, it should decrease. You see yeah, 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 so, well, so it's a, it's a, the same way, I mean, if you, I just put a quotation here, which is another issue. I mean, of course, you understand that if you bel- if you understand the capital con- Cambridge capital controversy, then you understand that the true answer should be a multi-sectoral model where you have different sort of capital. Okay. Now, in the last paper by Piketty in American Economic Review, where he comments his own book, where he says, you know, everything you you believe, I wanted to say in my book, I didn't want to say it. So this is not a book about the future, even though the title says capital in the 21st century, etc., etc. Then he always he al- also says. Uh, I should have the quotation somewhere. Yeah. I believe that the right model to think about rising capital income ratios and capital shares in recent decades is a multi sector model of capital accumulation with substantial movements in relative prices and with important variations in bargaining power over time. So, this is a way to say everything I didn't do, I should have done it. <laughs> but of course, he will claim, oh, you know, I thought about it. So. Please do. Uh, also, this morning we were talking about uh, capital inequality, gross yeah. interest capital for making investment, and but uh, we didn't we didn't talk really about human capital. Yeah. And I I think it's a a key variable linked to <coughs> all the profits uh, because uh, from one side we have gross interest capital formation, but I think nowadays it's even more important the human capital investment. And I would like to know your opinion. Huh? Education. Yes, something like that. Uh, how can enter the discussion of PKT inequalities in a book? Well, so in his book, what he says is that he doesn't believe in human capital. Okay? Uh, and and ten pages later, he will say, oh, you know, the most important thing is education. <laughs> <laughs> okay? No. And so, and here in this, in this, uh, in this kind of framework, uh, the question is how do you increase or decrease labor productivity? So here, labor productivity is supposed to increase uh, deterministically at uh, some exponential rate, which is given a priori. Of course, we should make this endogenous. This would be a way to enter into the very interesting debate regarding human capital. This, we haven't done it. Um, it's up to you if you want to do it. Welcome. Thank you. What you've done here is really a great way to um, expose the hidden logic that, that follows if we just are consistent in terms. Then we get to the fact that, for example, if you have to grow, you like human capital. I don't like human capital either. I know it's a way of talking about many things that we've adapted um, and so that we don't have to use the word exploitation or we don't have to use other words, or we can't think of those words because we have these other things. So again, this, this is his dissent, kind of from this privileged position inside, but not so inside. I mean, it's, it's, so in some ways, um, I guess the question that we would, you know, I, I, these are two, these are some really deficient critiques, I think, of the PPT uh, effort, as we've seen it. Um, the, then the, the next question would be, well, do we then go and take models that dialogue with them, but bring in some of the Cambridge traditions and talk about some of that? Yeah. Perhaps. Then we got to go and start to talk about multi-sectoral things. Yeah. And, and then and once we go multi-sectoral and even multi-country, only then can we get to the north-south, the global north yeah. global south question, <coughs> which, you know, will raise the question of some of the work that Steve's doing and, and, and others whether there could exist a set of relatively comfortable, um, but yet simply, you know, simple enough models that make basic points about, if you will, Keynesian slash Marxian ways of seeing the world that show that there's, I mean, sort of like this alternative to the DSGE as a broad sure. frame. Sure. And to say that, yeah, we're in simulation world today. 
And uh, the way that Steve said it about uh, uh, Engelbert's work, Engelbert, I think, gives us with that uh, wheelchair thing the giant stylized back. Um, he doesn't pretend it's a macro model. In fact, that's just as some of you who are in Berlin know that that's been one of the controversies. People who wanted to be a tribute of that work and he had to do it this far. Engelbert says, no, no, this is just a stylized back. And the, the macro model may be here. And, and it's not a complete model, nor does it pretend to be. So it means that, uh, in some sense, you have the potential for more sophisticated, uh, let's say, models that are parallel to some of the DSP stuff. Because, as you know, they're going to wrinkle that, wrinkle that, wrinkle that. Um, and we can conduct, in a sense, a war of tradition as well as a war of strategy, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Mm. But the program you are suggesting is exactly what you try to do. I mean, I mean, there is a paper with uh, Antonin and, uh, and Adrien which deals with the multi-sector framework that will be available very soon, I hope. The simulations of what Matthew's presented should be available so in a couple of hours. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we are we are we are we are, we are, okay, we are okay. We are walking. Before supper. Okay. We thank everyone thank for you. especially the participants. Thank you very much. Yeah, fine.